My presentation is called the Artificial Intelligence in History, Literature, and More. And that's a fun and more. Uh, I already used my first talk for many reasons, and uh, rather than doing a PowerPoint presentation, I was looking for a, a means to convey it. And I was originally going to write my own presentation program, but due to lack of time and resources, I realized that the program more does pretty much everything I needed, so I just had the whole damn thing run through it. Uh, okay, table of contents. Introduction. Um, okay, concept overview. What is artificial intelligence? Is sort of what I'm aiming to get at in this presentation, or not, not so much what it is, but how it's been represented and how, um, because we really don't know what it is, because in order to know what artificial intelligence is, we must know what intelligence is. And that's... <laughs> and if you know what intelligence is, please tell me, because you're probably the most famous and brilliant philosopher in the world. Um, and I'll be going through, uh, giving some background on myself, uh, and going through all of, I, I've done a bunch of research on this, um, and hopefully getting to a point at the end if I have time. Okay, I, I said it. And if anybody's saying, uh, anyone familiar with Asimov? That's a fun off of the book iRobot, which is a brilliant masterpiece. Um, let's see. Credentials? I have absolutely none. Um, the reason I signed up for this presentation is because it was um, post-death kind of think it was obviously 16th or something. I, I don't know, I'm a big fan of Stanley Kubrick, and I like the movie 2001 Space Odyssey, so, um, and then watched you know, other sorts of sci-fi, and I really didn't know a lot about AI, so I figured the best way to learn about it is to sign up to give a presentation on it in time. So, that's where this comes from. Okay. <laughs> My history, um, let's see, I've been working with computers, quote, working, quote, unquote, for the past 17 years, really, ever since, like, the mid to late 80s, when I first could. I've uh, been online since, like, 92, 93. Uh, let's see. Um, during, I guess, freshman and sophomore year in high school, I began doing web pages, so this was 96, 97. And during that time, I uh, started the commercial website, all3stuff.com, which is now defunct. It's been so since the dot-com crash of 2000. Uh, let's see, since then, hmm. Let's see, since then, what have I done? I've been uh, active in 2600 for the last four or five years, although the political situation with that has gone up and down. It's always oscillating. You're never quite sure what's going on. It's really evident from the magazine, reading it. Um, but I really like the original cause of the magazine, which is to the freedom of information, which it, it is also the point of the whole hacking culture if you've read Stephen Davies' Hacker's book, which is where I got some of this material from. Um, I'm also going to be working on, uh, with Ilanka Dunham and a few others, on an organization I'm attempting to form called Midwest 2600, sort of modeled in fashion after SE 2600. And uh, actually, if you thought I'd like to my shirt, uh, please buy it because I'm poor and I really, really need the money. <laughs> but yeah, it is my website, it's uh, Let's see, mw2600.org, the link to it. And the beautiful thing about this shirt is it's completely open source. I have the JPEGs of these images up on the website. Um, it's at nicerx.net slash pn7. So if you want to take them and get them printed yourself, feel free. Let's see. Interest in AI. Um, the, the way that I got into artificial intelligence was, let's see. First, Stephen Levy's Hackers. If you haven't read it, read it, because it's one of the most brilliant books on agriculture I've ever read. Um, so I like Levy, and I did this thing where I like to read multiple books by the same author, so I then read Crypto, which I read in conjunction with uh, Ilanka's cryptography work that uh, she's actually going to be giving a presentation tomorrow. I encourage you all to see it. Oh. At four. At four? Okay, tomorrow at four. Uh, so I picked up Stephen Levy's Crypto and decided to read that, and it was really amazing. So I decided to go to the next step and read, well, started to read Artificial Lives by Levy. I've only actually about halfway through it, so 
I'm doing the best I can with it. Uh, let's see, fetishes, beat girls, uh, conferences, uh, say, <laughs> personal ads are hard to do on the spot. So, uh, if you want to, uh, find out more about that, I have my business card, quote unquote business, right up here, so just take it and, uh, find out more. Next, what is intelligence? Uh, well, these are the questions that I'm going to be attempting to achieve. How can living creatures be imitated in the past? Uh, how can this be extended to technology? How does... Uh, I'm just reading it off. Uh, but these are the basic questions that we get when we're trying to deal with exactly what intelligence is and how the knowledge that we get from understanding, honestly, how we work and how we think can be extended and applied to technology. Uh, and yeah, this... I was actually originally looking up history and there are a bunch of websites that and I had to have those, and I'm sure a lot of students that are doing it or support for school will just go and you know download it and stick it into the paper somehow. And I'd like to note that this was not all just copy pasted from random history so <laughs> yeah. So uh, I like to begin as far as history goes, Aristotle. Um, I haven't read a whole lot of him, I've read more Plato than I have of Aristotle, but he essentially um, I don't remember the book it was that he wrote this in, but he um, was the first to write down the ideas and the formal notions of logic. Uh, and you can take in logic, you have the, you know, one and zero, one and zero um, XOR and things like that, which is essentially the foundations of what computers are built upon. Uh, this is really cool. Um, Jacques de Maupassant, um, he made, this is how I read about the artificial life. This mechanical copper duggy thing, essentially, is, um, this, this is in 1738. I mean, this is pre-industrial revolution. And this guy managed to create this duck that was able to simulate um, basically a real duck um, that drinks, eats, quacks, does about everything a normal duck would do. And leads to the phrase, uh, you know, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And he was trying to go on that and to formalize the point. The duck was realistic enough to uh, convince observers that it was that it had intelligence, and as it shows there, the, this stuff was just an amazing moral for the time being. Unfortunately, um, I followed up on this duck story a bit, and the duck, um, it was, um, let's see, the original duck was lost, and another guy found the model that the, that uh, Bocasson was using for the duck. Um, I don't remember the second guy's name. He made another duck, which was also lost. So unfortunately, we have no blueprints nor evidence except for records and historical documents, newspapers and such uh, for history. And if you don't want to copy a slave, then, I mean, who doesn't? Come on. It's like a little copper elf or something. That'd be great. Good <laughs> story. Okay, on to the 19th century. Uh, we have different uh, famous mathematicians, uh, George Boole and Charles Babbage especially. Uh, the reason I put these guys in is because we can't really have technology and look at artificial intelligence being applied to technology without understanding how these guys worked. Uh, and uh, George Boole established the idea of the Boolean value, which hopefully all of you are familiar with. Uh, and yeah, he was slightly significant. Without him, we wouldn't have Boolean algebra, among other things. Uh, Charles Babbage uh, developed the analytical engine. Um, one of the interesting things about Babbage is that um, he never actually finished anything. He had, this thing. Um, he had a habit of picking up all these amazing hobbies and starting to work on different topics and ideas, and he never quite finished all of them. Um, he was a professor at MIT or something. Or, no, I can't remember where it was. But, yeah, he had a really notorious reputation for never quite being able to finish anything. And uh, Ada Lovelace, who I hope that ACS majors are familiar with, she's credited as being the founder of computer science. Essentially, what was going on with Babbage and Ada Lovelace was Babbage was constructing mechanical designs for his um, analytical engine, which was he, he noticed patterns in mathematics and he applied these into mechanical forming to develop a mechanical device that would simulate these mathematical features <coughs> and um, essentially form a primitive calculator. That's the best comparison we have for today. And Anna Lovelace looked at this and she noticed that different uh, formations of the me mechanisms within this machine 
could be uh, applied to attain different results, thus getting the idea of programming a machine to do something different. Like having a single machine that you can program to do different tasks, so you wouldn't have to build a new machine for everything you wanted to do. Uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, the reason I include this is because um, this was published around the time when Industrial Revolution hadn't really started yet, but it was beginning to really build up. And we have the conception of what, what exactly is Frankenstein, but it's a man-made creation. This man, uh, Frankenstein is creative life. And examining what exactly it is, uh, how society would respond if we were um, trying to, if we actually succeeded, because we have so many strides where we're trying to attain this, but what if we actually did create life? Uh, she was one of the earlier examples of it of um, expressing this view, and it's been expressed later on, as I'll show. And the social inclusion, it just, people generally like to desire something, but they're not happy when they actually get it. That's the best way of putting it. I can think of right now. Let's see. The second part of history. Um, engine aspects, EM forestries and machine stops. Um, all of you are familiar with the matrix, I'm assuming? No. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, yeah I'm still asking. <laughs> the Matrix is a terrible movie and based on a terrible philosophy that shall never be shared in here. Um, but very cool special effects. What? Yeah, it has great special effects. Um, let's see. But the machine stops. The reason I include this is because the ideas in the Matrix, the whole notion of um, intelligence and having new forms of reality, this is not new at all. And it dates all the way back to 1906. And it actually, I believe it goes farther back than that. That's the earliest solid example I could find one. And the story is brilliant. It's um, about basically the world being, um, I don't want to say entombed, but just a machine that makes every um, makes everything the same, that you could basically have the machine do anything you want. Say you want it to be night, you want it to be dark, you want to have a TV show you're watching, or uh, you can summon anything at your, at, at your will's request, and you're basically granted satisfaction. Um, and when the machine stops, what happens? You know, what, when you're set to live on your own again, as opposed to being dependent upon a machine, what's going to happen? It's an amazing story. Um, I have not read this play from KFX uh, R.U.R. Um, I picked this up from uh, reading the introduction to the second in the, the uh, robot series by Asimov. But it's especially important because it's the first use of the word robot. Um, derived from the Czech word for compulsory labor. So what this tells me is that robot being uh, derived from compulsory labor, what exactly is going on in the world at this time? We have the Industrial Revolution that's building up. Um, steam engine was developed in the 1850s, I believe. Um, and we were starting to build up these megalopolises. And it, it's completely changing the front. Uh, it's connecting it, it, it's connecting people the way in a way they've never been connected before. And there ha and when people are grouped together in a situation like that, um, it, it's essentially the term lemmings. There has to be somebody to do the work. And when people began to do a habitual, when, when people began to do the same thing over and over every day, um, honestly. Sometimes you can't just call them robots because. Uh, so, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And uh, to uh, let's see, 1967, the first line of the release of Metropolis, which goes along the point uh, where we have this huge corporation, uh, Megalopolis, built up, and these people are finally realizing what's going on, and they get sick and tired of it. They get sick and tired of being controlled, they want their independence again, and they just. Oh, and the, you know, like the enforcer the machine stops and what happens there. Uh, there are other examples of this. There is, um, I don't remember the year, there's the Charlie Chaplin film, Modern Times. It's, that's an interesting one as far as, the, that, that's the way, that's the Prussian era. Um, but they all uh, tend to reflect the social environment at that time. And without the social environment being the concept of these massive corporations and the notion of machines doing everything for us, we couldn't have what happens next, which you get the stories of Asimov, including I, a robot, which as I said is brilliant, uh, follows the three laws of robotics, which, uh, anyone here read I, robot? Okay, 
Yes. Okay. So you're familiar. Essentially, what this is saying is a robot may not injure a human being through an action or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. Uh, two, a robot must obey orders given to it by human beings, um, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protect uh, as long as it doesn't conflict with the first or second law. Um, so essentially. If you take a look at the word robot here and run back to uh, uh, Carl Capex's play, it applies perfectly, and that point is actually, uh, that's actually the point of the book. Um, very good, I recommend reading it. And yeah, Newton, or not Newton, Asimov was just an amazing philosopher, really. He, he was a philosopher who expressed his work through writing. This was, I think, I wrote I was late 30s, early 40s, someone noticed, published a uh, Let's see. I remember that was originally published as a short story in a magazine, and uh, all all of his stories were published like that, and they eventually were turned into a compilation. So now, fiction becoming reality. This is where it starts to get interesting. Um, there are two important men. The first one is Alan Turing. In 1936, he conceives of the finite state machine, which, um, as far as I've found, is the first real proposition for what we now know as a computer. Uh, the finite state machine was. Um, it, it was, if you can imagine a floppy drive or even further back a tape drive, uh, you have a tape drive and you have a rewrite head that can have, uh, that can write in different states on it, and then you have a chunk of memory. It's a bit more complex than that. I was actually going to make a model, but I couldn't uh, get the resources together in time. Um, but the, the uh, finite state machine is essentially the foundation for what we know today as computers. Uh, the Church Turing hypothesis is the other thing that uh, Eric knows Turing is being famous for so far. Is that the Turing machine can duplicate not only the functions of machines, but those of nature. And the Turing test, which was absolutely brilliant, is essentially. Uh, uh, anyone familiar with Alan Turing's work? Okay. <laughs> Tell me if I'm boring you. Uh, which was a person who was typing in, typing questions into a console, uh, into a computer, and there is a person and a machine, both of which uh, submit replies to it. And when the original submitter cannot tell the difference between the replies to the person and the machine anymore, uh, the machine has passed the Turing test. Okay. Now, uh, just what defines life? Now that we have the notion of computers, John von Neumann went on to uh, go on the biological ideas we have of what exactly life is. Autonomy, uh, that it is independent of uh, something that can uh, go walking on its own, it can uh, homage for itself, it can find its own food. It has the ability to grow, the ability to reproduce, and it can evolve. And evolution, um, it, at least uh, speaking with Darwin, the laws of Darwin, is one of the most important aspects of uh, something that's alive. But the interesting thing about all of four of these is that all four of them have also been represented to some extent in uh, different programming language, in different uh, forms of programming. Such as uh, viruses, polyamorphic worms, etc. So, von Neumann, however, because computers didn't really exist at that time, this was 30s and 40s, uh, this is actually World War II, pre World War II, in the middle there. Uh, von Neumann coined the term automaton, which is essentially the earliest notion of something that can evolve. And I tried to display it here, it doesn't really look very good. Um, essentially, you have uh, a ch you got a square there, which contains each square is in a different state, and each state represents, um, say, genes um, like uh, genetics, human DNA, and the tail is the aspect that reproduces. And um, as the as the automaton reproduces, it copies its genes into different ways based upon the states of the genes and those around it, and it begins to form different form. It, it begins to assume different formations, and there are a lot of uh, interesting theories that have come out of this. Um, however, this delves into artificial life, which is at times a completely different field than artificial intelligence, because artificial life deals with what is like going to the military experiments and going into the more biological aspects, whereas AI is more how we think. Uh, and, and to follow that up, uh, 1952, the tic-tac-toe game was created for the Ed Set game. Tic-tac-toe, it's like 
Uh, anyone who's uh, done electrical engineering work with an oscilloscope, um, you have these little figures that appear in the oscilloscope by uh, electrical signals, and that's essentially what they call the gain spectrum. So, uh, reality check in the 40s and 50s. We have all these amazing th technology feeds going on um, in the real, in, in, I don't want to say that, in the academic world. And uh, then we step up to World War II, and suddenly there's a demand for this. Uh, we have the Enigma. Alan Turing uh, did a lot of cryptographic work. Um, the Colossus, which um, there were a lot of big computers that were developed specifically to crack the codes uh, the Japanese and for them ultimately the Russians. The, let's see, Japanese purple was in World War One. I. I don't remember what the Japanese code of World War Two was, uh, but. Essentially, there were a lot of these big computers that were designed specifically to crack codes, and uh, you had the famous Blush League Park, and Alan Turin, and uh, many other cryptologists were stationed in Britain doing a lot of work for the Atlas. And uh, they, they took a lot of ideas from Newman, and um, there's a great movie called Colossus, The Foreman Project. I haven't read the book series yet, but the movie itself is really good. It's, I think, 60s, somewhere in there. I don't remember exactly the movie. But, uh, it essentially has the first notion of um, the Allies build a, the United States builds a computer um, and the computer takes on life of its own and winds up. Um, I, I don't want to get too much into it, but it, let's say it builds, it develops a life of its own and it has some really interesting uh, side effects. And we also have in the 40s Roswell. Um, which is any number of conspiracy theories. You could say that um, UFOs crash landed. You could say that it was a government project that landed. Um, and this spawned movies like The Day the Earth Stood Still on this, uh, led home to a number of different uh, conspiracy, theory, uh, conspiracy theory ideas. And also, yeah, the Day the Earth Stood Still. I can't remember any other films right off hand. Question? Uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions at any time. Cause this is the only guidance I've had, and I'm trying not to read off it. Um, going away from the real world, which, um, uh, away from the real world and back to Nika at uh, MIT. Uh, John Horton Conway, uh, I think once familiar with uh, earlier MIT work, uh, life was essentially, it was almost developed upon the same idea as uh, Von Neumann's automaton, except that life was, well, it's, life was, Anyone ever played Go? Yeah. Okay, Clayton. It, it goes upon similar principles to Go, but it's, um, you have pieces on, you have pieces on a checkerboard, or, well, as it was in Conway's office, they wound up growing out the, through his entire floor and out his uh, hallway. But you have a piece on a square, must move or die. Um, if the piece moves, uh, other pieces are affected uh, by where it moves to. Uh, new pieces can be placed on the greater board, and old pieces may die. And essentially, it's a lot like life. You know, if a human is um, doing something, a human must do something, or a human does nothing, which includes not eating or not, you know, uh, doing anything. Uh, all sorts of different aspects will come in. And uh, Conway essentially very primitively defined, uh, started to simulate life in these four steps. And this really evolved like crazy, and it made all these different formations. Um, some, a lot of which are documented, but if you read Science of the American from like the 50s, there's a lot of interesting articles about it. Uh, like I was saying, um, the Martin Werner column in uh, Science of the America, Life Appeared, and um, the 1970 issue of it. And Will Gosper, who um, is the super uh, lead days are, uh, hackers, will know. Uh, Gosper was a, uh, I don't want to say the, because in that era, he was, he was a hacker. He, he was um, a brilliant coder. And he, he was reading this, and he decided to try to code it into his own computer. And he wound up getting essentially the same results as Conway, but because it was a computer, uh, it went a lot faster, and he was able to observe results a lot more. Uh, it, it was a much more efficient way of observing results. Question? Uh, regarding uh, Conway's view of life, he was totally evolving. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you, um, yeah, I mean, how, how does, how how does the evolve? life evolve? Is, uh, what, what are you using to determine a higher state of evolution? Oh, uh, as far as evolution, it's, 
Uh, each of the pieces that were on Conway's board uh, had different states. There was life, death, and birth, etc. And depending on what state it was in, um, these different pieces actually created formations. And it's not the, it's not the piece in the state of piece that's in itself, but the formations which uh, they have the, all, all the pieces together. It, the, best to, the best comparison would be to um, t- take um, an amoeba, for example. An amoeba being a one cell organism, and um, say, like, um, when you had, what are those called? Um, the the uh, fluids of life, the very beginnings of life, when they interchange with each other and begin to form in two different organisms. And you have different uh, cellular structures which combine into organs. And th- th- does that answer your question more? It, yeah, I mean, like, I, I understand, like, how the team safety things, but okay. I mean, like, calling some configurations more evolved than others. Is um, that's a really difficult question to answer. It's more the different things they formed. Like, if it formed a picture that would, say, say maybe something that resembled a force. But, yeah, it, I mean, this is really primitive. You can't call modern biology into this guy's work. Pokemon. What? <laughs> Pokemon evolved. You're all right. <laughs> all right. So, um, let's see. And meanwhile, at MIT, all these, uh, a lot of other kids are developing all sorts of cool things, which leads to things like the ITS, and which well, ultimately leads to what we now know as computers. Uh, Martin Aminsky, who is a famous professor at MIT, he's multiple to uh, several different papers on AI. I've only read a few of them, but he, he carries, he takes the initial ideas of Turing, Asimov, etc. that I've already listed, and he pulls it into the 1960s, and I've uh, read a couple of his papers from the 80s, too. Um, he, he essentially brings back the same questions of what exactly is life and what is what, what we're striving to attain right now does it really reflect what we know to be okay this one is really interesting um, anyone familiar with the Boyd's experiment Craig Reynolds did this um, essentially this guy uh, he was he, he was trying to think of a project for a class or something and he decided he wanted to develop something that would imitate the hawking cycle of birds. And he would go to, there was a park near his house that he would, near the storm room, I think it was, that he would go to. And he, he would sit with friends and he would watch a formation of birds. And he would take notes on this. And over a period of months, he ultimately uh, tr- turned the uh, movement of the flock into three simple steps, which is absolutely extraordinary given the complexity of the formation of the clock seems to have. Uh, the first, a clumping force that keeps the clock together, an ability to match the velocity so the birds in the clock are moving at the same speed, and a separation force that prevents the birds from getting to, uh, uh, too close to each other. So you don't have birds crashing into each other. It's fairly second nature to all of us. However, if you manage to code this into a, a, a program, which uh, he got the ramp, and to his surprise, it actually almost uh, flawlessly imitated the clock in style of birds. And he called these boys. Voice- and there are a lot of interesting stories that came from there, different, um, not really mutations, but d- d- he, he would uh, take the clock of birds, he would put hazards in it to see how they would go around the hazards. And it was just amazing to see how, out of these three simple rules, he was able to so closely imitate the clock in birds. Uh, then we have Joe Weisenbaum. I think this is actually A's. I put this in the wrong space. But uh, anyone familiar with Eliza? Yeah, the artificial intelligence psychiatrist, essentially. Um, let's see. Uh, Eliza, that, that gets into some more interesting things, essentially analyzing um, not so much speech patterns as how much how the uh, power language works. And Eliza would take, if you would type in a command to Eliza, like, how are you doing? Uh, Eliza would take these commands, analyze them, and compare them to given responses, and compare your sentence structure, and prepare, your stru- prepare a response out of it. Um, and he actually succeeded in making, and this, I guess not, not by modern day, it wouldn't be considered too exceptional, but for his time it was something that actually came close to simulated a conversation with another human. It was in the 60s. What? It did come out in the 60s? Okay, thanks. However, as recently as like five years ago in the Chaos Computer Camp, 
They set Eliza out to talk to journalists, and they put a brain in a jar and ran wires to it, and a full of journalists. I, I remember it being an AIM bot not that long ago as well. About five yeah, years ago. yeah. Well, it was still around. I think it was Eliza. Yeah, yeah and, and there have been different options of Eliza that go into the, yeah. uh, all sorts of different fields, some of which may not be, need not be so. There was a bot named Buddy in Lambda Moo who got my sympathy every time I went by. He said, it's been a week since Strict Night has talked to me. And they really work. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, going to the 60s and 70s, yeah, do not think about what your parents did. Um, <laughs> parents, uh, <laughs> to put it on. Uh, different science fiction works by Heinlein in particular, like a Stranger in a Strange Land, I consider one of the most brilliant pieces of fiction I've ever read. Um, essentially, it takes uh, a man who was born on Mars, a human who was born, or no, he was born on the moon, uh, by the lunar people, and he's transported back to Earth, and it's how he interacts uh, with people on, the, uh, on Earth. And it, it's just a marvel to see how the interaction occurs. And you also have L. Ron Hubbard, um, who uh, went on to form the Church of Scientology. Uh, twisted, uh, other interesting works by Kurt Vonnegut, William Burroughs, John Beatnik authors, etc. Let's see. You have various TV shows. This is all coming out of the public's perception of what we have in technology. Uh, you have various TV shows. I already mentioned Outer Limits and the Twilight Zone. In 1968, which is the inspiration of this lecture, Cooper releases 2001 Space Odyssey, and I hate to say this, but the book is much better. Uh, which essentially points the idea of what, is, what, what if there is something greater than that? What if uh, there is an entity which we don't understand? And it um, generally goes into an interesting tangent on that. And uh, then we start to get things like video games. We have part of this, um, what's it called? Norman Bushnell, I believe, was that the creator? Yes. Okay. And you know, it's part of, and you start to get these games which are based on uh, Essentially, the AI algorithms that came out in the MIT labs, and except that they're starting to be more targeted towards the general populace. Now we have the 70s. Uh, Star Wars is an awful movie. <laughs> there, it's terrible acting, and the first and second episodes exemplify this one. Yes? I like Star Wars. Sit down and pay attention, you robot. <laughs> And you also have Riddle Escher Bach, which, um, anyone ever read this book? Yeah. Yes, this man is a genius. Um, and I actually started reading that book a year and a half ago. I, was in, I didn't know what it was, and it wound up coming into AI. And he makes a comparisons like uh, the formation of an ant uh, colony to the human brain, and how different levels of the workings in the ant colony can be compared to that of a brain. How ultimately hierarchy of hierarchy of activity is represented on many different levels, and let's see, it, it can also be shown in like programming languages. Um, you don't need to know assembly very well to program based, and that's the best way to put it. Um, you have various AI, uh, I'm sorry, Atari derivatives that are going on that concept. So we have we still have evolution of AI in the common world, and we also have various Atari derivatives. Um, we, the mass populace is being introduced to all these really cool little gadgets that are coming out. Uh, 80s, the dawn of the BBS systems and massive propagation. This, this is where everything just explodes. Uh, you have Verizon RPG games, um, Zoroark Ultimate, etc., and soft porn. Uh, and the reason I include these is because the RPG has to be. Uh, th these games, they have to. The enemies that we fight against have to be. have to have some sort of way of understanding how to players moving. And they each have, especially with strategy games that were released, um, they had to have certain algorithms um, that were encoded into the computer that would try to understand how the player was moving. It wasn't necessarily intelligence as we would hope it to be. It was, you know, a nice body inconvenience. Um, which was a derivative. Uh, that, that's more encoded of Dungeons and Dragons type stuff games that were earlier. Now you have movies, war games, which is a classic. Uh, which First Amendment is an interesting uh, is a zine. I recommend it. Check out textfiles.com for it. 
uh, you have Tron, uh, you have Short Circuit, you have The Last Starfighter, all these different movies that are, let's see, Short Circuit, Tron, and War Games to some extent, they all show AI, but they also show how AI technology has influenced computers, or has influenced popul- uh, people in the world. Um, and how, how we're responding to it. We're getting all this, short circuit especially, where you have this robot that gets introduced to somebody who's never seen a robot before, and something that resembles like on spirit. And Blue Velvet is a great movie, it has nothing to do with AI, but I liked it in a bunch of life, so. <laughs> Okay, also, Kohanaskazi. This is a brilliant film. Um, it's a, who are the two guys? You got Philip Glass and Francis Ford Coppola that worked on this, and a couple others. And it's essentially um, a look at how technology has influenced the world and how the world in itself mimics technology. And it's 1983, so it's just when computers are starting to get to a point where um, mass production and computers can be really the connection to the same. Uh, I highly recommend that film, by the way. I didn't know about it until about a year, six months ago. Late 80s, early 90s. Uh, I mean, this just shows how far AI has come. You have Gizmo, you have Pure Trigger, Small Wonders, all these different things that, um, in order for the theory um, to come so far, you have to have evolution of that to create these two TV shows. Uh, virtuality, anybody remember that? Back in like 93, 94, Virtuality was, yeah, I, I would. Which was the word, uh, you take AI and transform it into an artificial reality. And you get full immersion in AI. And you have the movie Lawnmower Man, which I wrote there, because that movie is terrible. Um, it, it's punishment to have to sit through that thing. Like, there's a couple of good parts, but for the most part, it's this horrible, boring drama that sucks. Um, see, mid 90s to the present, we have more movies. We have Existence, which I think, um, I, I was. Bashing the Matrix earlier, I think Existence does a much better job than the Matrix does of expanding the idea that there are multiple levels upon which we live and different perceptions. It's also Shield Experiments Lane, which, um, can anyone explain it? Because I can't. Uh, it's, it's completely screwed up. That's really the only way you can think yeah. about a girl who is not sure where she exists in life. And yeah. By the end of the, if you've seen it and you understood it, please come tell me because I've watched it twice. It's I'm basically sure about a, a computer program that's well, very advanced a, in the in the in the, yes. in the cyber world, and there's a flaw in the TCP/IP protocol, basically. But it's version <laughs> like you know 29, and well, it allows her to cross over into the real world. Yeah, so no, they refer to version four and say version six is going to replace it. So they actually are using that. Oh, it is six. Yeah, what it's supposed to be. I couldn't remember. Did they make a request to IPv6? Yeah. Those are the ones that are going to be IPv6 allows people to cross over from the space to reality. I didn't know this was implemented yet, but apparently I'm wrong. <laughs> Watch out. The better explanation of the just of the, the series is that there is a virtual reality that is shared, and everybody who joins in right. and is on the shared network they can all interact. Okay. But uh, uh, and people are going to the lives and the network. It does make the virtual reality. Yeah. 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 Some people like the girl. EVA is like a special um, place, but those are a god character, which uh, is uh, a lot easier to explain than the thing is. Uh, though it's not, in my opinion, nearly as good. And it also takes up those completely different points the series makes. But Evangelion has the whole notion of, um, what are those things called? The angels? Yeah, the angels. That you have these angels that um, essentially you put life into. Um, I'm trying to explain that. Um, but it comes out from a different perspective, and it's, it, it's another interesting way to do it. Okay, now we have modern implementations of AI. Now we sort of understand how AI has been represented in view through history, and how it's been, how it's been uh, developed on the technology side, and how it then transforms into the real world. What do we have in the future? Um, uh, anybody been to a, a, what are the grocery stores around here? I'm from St. Louis. Oh, okay, you got Kroger here. Um, like in, in St. Louis, we have grocery stores, uh, Schnucks and Deerbergs, which they're doing this thing called electronic cashiers. I don't know if it's being done around here or not. Yeah, but okay, yeah. Which essentially is taking the functions of a cashier, which is pretty rudimentary, pushing buttons. I do it. 
Uh, I, I'm recapturing myself. And, uh, yeah. Look, no boss. Yes, Craigie. What? Yeah. But taking the functions of cashier and saying, well, we really don't need this because we can program a machine to do it for us. And it's developed, it, it's coming into a whole lot of different controversial issues, just like Rachel and Frankenstein originally predicted back in 1815 or whenever it was written. The same idea is that when we're finally beginning to attain machines that can reflect us, we really don't like it a whole lot. Um, smart bombs, uh, military technology, especially that are used to, in military combat to zero in on targets to, to reduce casualties to a minimum. Uh, there are all sorts of different military uses for that. Video games are becoming a lot more complex. Uh, I kind of left off with Pong and Atari and, I mean, come on, we do in the early 90s, which leads to whatever we have today. I stopped paying attention to it a few years ago. But artificial intelligence and games especially, the physics involved today is transformed the next dimension. Um, graphic rendering, racial recognition, um, especially with, uh, with, with the advantages of cryptology and cryptography lately, um, it led me in the past 10 years. Uh, the, the, it's necessary to begin to understand um, different ways of verifying, and of course, facial recognition is one way that comes up. And then you have other things like, um, say, a surveillance camera that's taking uh, photos of um, a mall area, and you see part of somebody's face, and you have a computer that's able to predict what the rest of their face looks like. So, you know, assuming they're kind of stealing goat porn or something, you can put your mug up on them. Picture. <laughs> yeah. And have the police go after them, have somebody turn them in. Uh, you have programs like Mathematica, um, written by Stephen Wolfram, who is, well, Wolfram also had a lot to do with uh, artificial life, which I didn't really go into much on in this. Uh, you have programs like Enable, anybody who's done any sort of math about calculus has used these. But when you take a look at the algorithms that these programs actually incorporate, um, I mean, they have to use a lot of artificial intelligence as far as branch prediction is concerned, because essentially that's what intelligence is, according to some theories, is branch predictions. Um, let's see. Important notes of interest. Yeah. <laughs> the RI But Microsoft. Uh, by the way, these are my opinions, not those of you. Oh, yeah, you said take care from the DMCA. Yeah. Fuck Blackboard. Ah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Dot com. Finally. Oh, me. Oh, yeah. 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 So these are my references that I cited. Uh, Pong thing. That's where I picked up the, the date or something about Pong when I was using it. Artificial Life, um, excellent book that I can say it for the first half of it. Very Lesser Rock is an excellent book for the first uh, two thirds of it. I can say uh, the Hacker Crackdown is also excellent. Um, Hackers by Stephen Davy, I Robot by Asimov. Uh, there are a slew of others I can list here that I haven't got, and well, I'm sure you know. Them. Uh, any questions? Why did you just blatantly leave Transformers out of the mix? <laughs> Transformers! Because I was really <laughs> out of it while I was writing this presentation. Because, oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, that is to me the epitome. It's a thinking machine that fights for its, you know, like whatever. <laughs> Um, I wanted to know what you thought about the fact that we really don't have a working computer brain in any semblance. That goes along. I've had two uh, smart offs up there with me. Um, <laughs> and and uh, what, what we're going to do, I guess, is how are we going to write computers that can actually think on their own when we don't understand the way the brain works in the first place? That deals with the question that dates all the way back to the struggles of Aristotle. Um, I wish I could answer that. I actually got to an argument with a friend who ultimately proved to me that... Well, I didn't answer, I wanted an opinion. What? I know you don't have an answer. Oh, okay. okay. So you want my opinion as to how we can... Yeah, like, what are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Obviously, there's some interest in it. Uh, well, you've got all sorts of different uh, impediments that come in on um, different factors like emotion. Uh, you have... Uh, say, how is somebody going to react to the situation? Does that reflect on how their brain works? And, uh, are you going to approach it from a logical standpoint or um, a conscious standpoint, um, a biological standpoint, etc.? Uh, my opinion on it as far as what, as far as how to do it? 
No, do you think it's possible, I guess? Possible? Um, anything is possible. That's we're, we're kind of separate. You're confusing what it does with how it works. Well, see, we can we can mimic what it does, no. but we can't mimic how it works. Well, yeah. I can make a program that just says, like the classic example that comes to mind is the, the user-friendly script, where Peter writes a program that's you want the like a program. No. <laughs> <laughs> that where he writes a program and like if it, uh, you input an A, it says no, and if you put, you know, if you input a vowel, it said yes, or if it was a constant, it would say no, right? I mean, yeah, okay, that mimics it. It can, becomes a part of some opinion, but it's not really thinking. I mean, when you get right down to it, that's all we have right now. We have a Liza, we have smart bombs, but we don't have anything that's really thinking. We just have things that are going through if then logic steps, and that's all we've got. You really have to build those if then logic steps into a brain, right? What else is the mind but a bunch of computations? You're, you're absolutely right, but we're not we're not going that route. We're we're not. Not. Where? Okay. Where? We are. We still the mind. I can't. I know. I got my thing. My response to that, uh, excuse me, sir. My response to that is, what about if somebody just suddenly goes postal? How do you explain that? This what? Post, uh, goes postal. 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 They just go. You know, that temporary incentive. They go to postal. Colonel Bennett. Right? Yeah. Yeah. How do you explain that? <laughs> I guess the major difference there is when you're talking about that, you're just following, okay, for instance, if you were to take the power of a human brain to do one task, not to think, not to have a personality group, but just to think, it could blow a computer away, no problem. We, we think faster, we have more memory, we're, we're, we're way better than computers. Okay? But computers blow us away because they don't have to think on their own. They do one specific task, a program for one function. Right? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You have to build the brain, you have to make a brain, and at which point they would seem stupid to us. And that's, that's precisely where we run into the issue of when we do, if we were to create a machine that was able to replicate what we consider, we consider ourselves to be so much better than that which we create. What if we created something identical to ourselves that dates back to Genesis? Well, that would be great. I, I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. that. Which could lead into other questions of like, when do they betray us and all that, you know, the matrix. Yeah. But, um, but, but the question I'm asking is like, do, do we really have a chance of that? Or, or, or do you know of any projects that are going to that? I don't know of any projects going on right now. Hmm. Um, well, uh, the idea of intelligence has worked in many different forms. Uh, there's a lot of stuff with robotics going on in MIT, yeah, MIT's AI lab right now. Um, they, they do a lot of really amazing things. There was actually, um, at DEF CON earlier this summer, there was a, a robot thing that was able to, it was able to take uh, audio sensory and visual input uh, and process it and uh, output different things. Um, well, it does a lot more than that. I, I make it sound a lot blander than it really is. But I, we, we have uh, several different fields. I mean, some of them are mathematical. We have philosophers that are trying to understand the graphic philosophy, whereas we also have people who are building machines that they think closely resemble themselves, but uh, resemble their creators, but do they really? Let me, let me tell there, there are a great deal of um, interesting theories about how you go about mimicking the brain. I mean, you obviously can't get the actual chemicals going around. Well, I guess you could, but that'd be really key. Well, but we have binaries, so, I mean, we have numbers that go around just like our Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, so there are lots of different projects uh, based upon mimicking the brain at different levels. Um, you know, from, like, making artificial neurons that can talk to each other, that's what I see. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's lots of, like, any, 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 any neuroscience department is very excited. We'd love to talk to you about this for, you know, a very long time. I mean, so there's lots of research. The artificial I've got the car. We don't understand how it works. He's like, yeah. I'm going to open it if anyone wants to start some conversation. Karaoke? 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 Karaoke